welcome you to our May 9th commission meeting. And at this time, if you would all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Recording in progress. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, so no pattern set there. 352 total citations were issued, 26 uniform traffic citations, 241 warnings, 79 parking citations, and six voting warnings. Uh, there were a total of five felony arrests made, one for battery, one for grand theft, uh, traffic violation, and two non violations. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone who has any questions for Sheriff tonight? Hearing none, thank you. Thank you. Very nice. I'd like to remind everyone that the sheriff comes in 15 minutes before the meeting if anyone would like to talk to the sheriff privately. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to the Pineapple Suncoast Fire and Rescue. Chief, would you, Jeff, would you like to do a presentation for us? Sure. Good evening. I'm Jeffrey Davidson, Fire Chief Pineapple Suncoast Fire and Rescue District. Um, <clears throat> The crew from Engine 27, they were on their way here, and they're on a call right now. <clears throat> so that's why they're not able to be here. Um, monthly report for April, we had 75 calls in Indian Rocks Beach emergency responses from Pinellas Suncoast. Uh, 75, 57 of them were medical related, 18 fire related, with an average response time of four minutes and 20 seconds. Um, <clears throat> I'm proud to say that uh, our last meeting, I let you know about the um, child that drowned was uh, drowning and uh, that the child made a full recovery and is home now and doing well so we're very proud of the men and women who worked that call alongside the sheriff's office as well uh, this morning uh, our own Christopher Barnes was presented with the uh, firefighter EMT of the year award from Pinellas County 
at the Pinellas County Commission meeting. It's a very prestigious award. Um, thousands of um, employees and many nominations and Chris was chosen so you can see those pictures. It's on our Facebook page, um, Pinellas Suncoast Fire and Rescue District. And then lastly, want to let you know we are hosting a hurricane and water safety expo. It's going to be June 8th. Uh, it's Bel Air Beach City Hall. There's some flyers in the back of the room, but everybody is welcome to attend. Uh, there will be a free life jacket giveaway, a uh, free barbecue sponsored by the union. We'll have our fire boat demonstration, our water rescue demonstrations there. And uh, if I didn't mention, there's free food. <laughs> Please, uh, we'd like to see you there. It's from 1 to 6 on June 8th. Uh, the flyers are in the back. And thank you very much for allowing me to be here today. Does anyone have any questions for the chief tonight? I do. Yes. I'm going to ask you about Saturday's schedule. Is that your May your May 13th event? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I wasn't referring. I didn't know what you were referring to. Yes. Um, it's not actually my event. It's the okay. event that we're participating in. It's uh, called Fire Ops 101. Okay. And it's for elected officials and news media to be able to experience what firefighters go through on a daily basis. Um, it's a countywide effort being hosted at the Clearwater Training Grounds. And there's all kinds of demonstrations going on that day. Um, if you, it's not too late if you want to sign up. The only thing we ask is if you would like to participate you come see us ahead of time so we can get you fitted for gear and teach you how to use uh, self-contained breathing apparatus okay. if you wanted to participate or you could just go walk around and enjoy everything okay. and learn a few things that way as well um, and that that is this saturday 7 30 in the morning because i wouldn't have to save anybody would i you definitely <laughs> have to <laughs> so no, no it's you can participate as much or as little as you'd like to you okay know, really it but it really is a great event um, and we thank that sponsorship with uh, all of Pinellas County, sponsored by the Pinellas County Fire Chiefs Association. We all work together. We meet uh, every month and we talk about all the issues because we all have pretty much the same issues, right? Uh -huh. um, so we all work to together well. And our fire department is leading the extrication demo this year, which they'll have a car and uh, we'll show you how we train our firefighters to uh, remove a car from a person, right? And uh, that's pretty cool if you've never done that or seen that. It's a pretty neat thing to do. Can I do that on Saturday? You absolutely can. Okay. All right. All right. And I'll make sure we get lots of pictures of that. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on to public comment. Three-minute time limit for speaker. Any member of the audience may come forward, give their name and address, and state any comment or concern that they may have regarding any matter over which the City Commission has control, excluding agenda items. All state statements made to the City Commission shall be made to the City Commission as a whole, not directed to any individual City Commission member, and no personal or slanderous remarks shall be permitted. No speaker shall be interrupted, and no debate shall occur between the speaker and the Commission. At this time, is there anyone who'd like to come forward? Hi, Nancy. Good evening. Is this taller or am I getting shorter? <laughs> I'm not sure which. Well, by now you guys have probably all seen um, I'll say your name Nancy Sorry. Obarski, 708 Beach Trail. Thank you. By now you guys have all seen last week's little go crap in your hat nasty gram from the Army Corps of Engineers with regard to the beach renourishment. I want you to do me a favor, and especially the newcomers up there, Go back and watch the citizen comments on the July 13th, 2021 Indian Rocks Beach Commission meeting. That's a meeting that happened two months ago, uh, or two years ago, short of two months. Play, pay close attention to two speakers in particular, Hugh Smith and Diana Fuller, retired lawyers and beachfront property owners in Indian Shores. Here's one of Hugh's quotes. They, meaning the Army Corps of Engineers, came up with an arbitrary rule that has no foundation in federal law. Diana added some emphasis by saying, they say that's the law, but it's not. Three years ago, Hugh and Diana produced a pamphlet explaining why the Army Corps of Engineers has absolutely no right to ask us for these easements. And I distinctly remember how her information, or their information was received. Um, one member of the commission actually said that um, 
what the information in their pamphlet, some of it was incorrect. And when pressed to tell us what those discrepancies were, refused to do that in a meeting, but said they would follow it up with an email. Needless to say, that email never came. And after I gave up coming here, here's how it went at the county commission for me. For the umpteenth time, I urged them to meet with you and Diana. One county commissioner looked at me and said, we have our own experts. Well, we see how her experts have worked out, didn't we? And the story was no different at a big C meeting when a mayor of a neighboring beach community looked at me and said, the real problem is we have too many lawyers involved in this already. After three valuable years that have been wasted positioning the property owners as the bad guys, up steps U.S. Representative Anna Paulina Luna, the very first elected official to embrace some of Hugh and Diane's facts. I watched Representative Luna go after the uh, House of Natural Resources Commission like a rabid dog. She said, I'm not even kidding. I'm about to go to the office and protest because it's nonsense. Right there, that's the fight the property owners have needed for the last three years. Sad is the fact that even if the Army Corps came to their senses right this very minute tonight, we're two or possibly three years out from ever getting sand. And if, if well, just a few more sentences. If you can't even bear to imagine, like I can't, what our beach is going to look like by then, please insist that the county use Hugh and Diana's information to immediately seek legal assistance from the state. The state should be interested because it's their responsibility by statute to maintain our beaches. And if the county won't do it, the, the five of you need to go do it. Go around them. Don't be don't be afraid to ruffle feathers for political reasons. Go at it. Don't let them stop you. Um, you need to wrap it up. Andrew. Okay. I, I think the time for beachfront photo ops and namby pamby letters from Charlie Quest and whining without facts are over. Um, we're in a mess right now. Make no mistake about it. And we need help. If the county won't help, you guys join hands and go after it. Thank you. Anyone else would like to come forward at this time? I'm afraid it would be Hi, I'm Diane Daniel, 309 10th Avenue. A couple months I came up here and, and sort of gave a laundry list of things that I would like to see. Uh, one of them was for the city to recognize Pride Month in June, and two commissioners came up to me just last week and asked me, um, Commissioner Vaughn and Vaughn, how I would see that happening, what, what ideas do I have, and, and so um, I thought that was a great question. Thank you, and I, and I gave it some thought, and I wanted to share that with you. First of all, I just wanted to, to tell you what Pride Month is, if you don't know. It honors the 1969 Stonewall Uprising in New York City. That is when police raided a gay bar and the patrons fought back, and it really was the tipping point in the gay rights movement. Um, why recognize it? Why should IRB recognize it? Uh, because there are a lot of LGBT people who live here, because people care about us, because we are often censored and censured, and because right now the state of Florida would like to basically erase us. This sends a terrible message to everyone, but especially to our young people, uh, to myself, to our neighbors. So for young people, they face bullying, violence, and they have um, so much higher risk of suicide. So there are a lot of good reasons to recognize it, and here are some of the reasons, some of the ideas I have. I'm happy to brainstorm others. I'm sure other people have ideas. In the same way that we do for Black History Month, the library could display books by gay authors and also display books that have uh, LGBT subject matter um, all month in June. Uh, which they do for Black History Month. At the June 13th meeting, the commission could officially proclaim June as Pride Month, or if you don't really proclaim things, perhaps you can honor it in some other way that works for you all. 
The city could display the pride rainbow symbol in some fashion. Largo, for instance, will be flying the rainbow flag for the month and will also be having rainbow colored lights in front of City Hall. Um, not for this year because it's too late, but for next year, IRB could have a presence at the St. Pete Pride celebration. They have a lot of different events through the month of June. It's the largest um, LGBT celebration in the state of Florida, and the parade attracts about a quarter million people, visitors and residents. So those are just a few ideas. I really hope you'll consider them, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Diane. Hi, Jose. Uh, Jose Coburn for Grove Boulevard. Uh, I'm, I want to thank the mayor for participating in the uh, meeting with uh, the U.S. Corps of Engineers in Washington. On Washington, the um, uh, the response I understand is negative from the U.S. Corps of Engineers. Our property was uh, singled out among uh, 30 or so properties uh, seven years ago where the, um, they requested uh, easements. I checked the elevation of the drawings shown uh, by the U.S. Uh, Corps of Engineers and it demonstrated that under no circumstances they would uh, put sand on a private property because of a new system existing was higher than the elevation that they had set. Uh, they said that doesn't matter, no eastman, uh, no sand. Um, I, I think they, they, they are obstinate about it and I see that uh, they have sent a, a new memorandum negating the fact that uh, unless they get 100% eastman on, on a certain area, they will not put sand. But I wish they would also take a look at the impact on native uh, habitat of uh, animals like turtles. And as a punishment, they, they should, uh, if I were the scientists, I would move them from Tallahassee, the U.S. Corps of Engineers, and put them to dig. Uh, for turtle nest, when they find that the nest have been, the eggs have not been hatched because they have been floated. So uh, now, on the letter that they sent, in my opinion, there is a, a kind of a trap. The, the Corps of Engineers says that the high water line and the erosion control line are one and the same. And I think that's an indication that if they want to use that, if the, if the flood comes into the seawall, they will make it hard to us to reclaim riparian right to the sand that would be, be deposited afterwards. Okay? So I think the team that deals with that should watch for the uh, response of the Corps of Engineering. Is there anyone else who'd like to come forward at this time? <coughs> Kelly Watt, 431 Harbor Drive South. So thank you all for the work you've done on the short-term rental bill. It's been a long road and you guys have done a really good job. Um, I would just like to request um, perhaps you reconsider the two-year vesting Kelly, um, we're going to be talking about that issue, so, so don't I can't mention that. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. No problem. Is there anyone else who'd like to come forward at this time? I don't. <coughs> Is this getting shorter or not getting taller? <laughs> Don House 21 of Fort Beach Bell. So to follow up on the 713-21 meeting, uh, that, uh, one thing was kind of unique, oh, by the way, I have somebody on Zoom that if I go for three minutes, she'll give me an extra three minutes, just so you know. What is that person's name, sir? Laura Welker. Uh, is there a Ms. Welker on the on Zoom call, sir? If not see one. If you're not seeing a Ms. Welker on the Zoom No, she's with okay. another. If, you, if we could reset the speaker's time to three minutes since it's taken at the Zoom. So she is there. She is there. Okay. Um, okay. Yes. All right. okay. So, so, revisiting 71321. Um, uh, 
one thing that was very unique about that meeting, we had two ex-mayors speak at that meeting. Uh, uh, I just checked the plaque to make sure they're both up there. One's R.B. Johnson and one is, is Hugh Smith. And so uh, R.B. Johnson uh, spoke very eloquently, like he normally does, about why he's uh, signed the easements that, 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 uh, for, for the sand. And it is a personal choice, which he uh, said, and he stated a lot of things that I totally agree with, that it was not, a, not needed at this particular time, it might be needed in the future, but it is not needed at this time, which is part of what all of us SFAs have been saying forever, that this is not something that's required, and that all the uh, cities up and down in the big city should be fighting this with the county. We should be fighting this. We should be getting sand because we should not have to be required to say that. But the, the thing that was most indicative of that, that was that um, uh, when uh, R.E. Johnson spoke, he spoke for 10 minutes and 21 seconds. Y'all can look at the video. It's online. That's how long he spoke. Not anyone told him, your three minutes are up. Not anyone said, could you wrap it up? Not anyone said, could you please sit down? Okay. Uh, I got up to, in, in most, most issues, there are two sides to, to what you might think. You believe, both believe, and in a civilized society, both, society, both sides present their, uh, their points of view and you figure out what's going on. Not so much in the interrupt speech. Uh, Bobby Johnson got to speak for 10 minutes and 21 seconds. I spoke for three minutes in rebuttal to R.B., but at three minutes, I was asked to wrap it up, sit down, shut up, I'm an SFA. Well, not exactly those words, but that was basically it. I was told to wrap it up, and when I said, I have another seven minutes because RV got that much time, and uh, our mayor responded, no, I run the meetings, you don't get to talk that long. Subsequently, there were other people that spoke in opposition to um, and most of these people do not own on the beach. The people that wrote the, the pamphlet that has been much, most consternation to our mayor, and we have not heard a response to that, were at that meeting, and they both spoke. The, the previous mayor, Hugh, and his wife, they both spoke that night, okay? And as a person that lives on the beach, and a property taxer, a property taxpayer in Indian Rocks Beach, I have this, when I look at stuff, we have two different things, okay? We have our mayor that... Uh, Don, is, what? you're not allowed to sing about a person on this board. Okay, okay. our city commission that, that doesn't necessarily listen to other people. Well, you know what? I could continue on, but somewhere along the line, I have to say that the representative that our city sent to Washington, D.C., instead of being two attorneys, is a hairdresser. And I'm not sure that that is the best use of the money of our city. If, if we're going to fight for this, which we obviously have to fight for, we need to bring our big guns in. And we had two attorneys speaking here like this is the reason that this is wrong and we need to fight for it. That's who we need to send to Washington, D.C. People that actually live on the beach, which they did. People who are actually asked to sign the easement, which they are. People who actually put in writing what they believe, which they did. People who actually, at their own expense, pay to send out a pamphlet to people, which they did. As opposed to us that, that have asked for why the city commission is not responding to what's wrong with this pamphlet, we don't get an answer. So when we have two, what I would consider a lot more powerful people, that's what we should spend our money on. If we're going to spend a thousand dollars for out-of-state tuition for council members to learn something that they could have learned. By the way, R.B. Johnson, our previous mayor, mentioned the same thing in his three minutes, actually his 10 minutes and 21 <coughs> seconds. Um, uh, and the county has mentioned it over and over again. This is not a hidden secret, okay? We need people with knowledge and fortitude to fight for this. Otherwise, the 
$1,000 we spend on out-of-state tuition, we should spend it on lottery tickets. And maybe we'll get some sand. Thank you, John, for your comments. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak before we wrap up the public comment? Hearing none, we'll go on to item number three. Report of the city attorney. Maybe the other should report to Yes, I do, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm in a place of slightly more information than I was during the pendency of uh, legislative session. Our legislative session ended last week on Friday uh, with Stiney Dye, um, which is the term for their adjournment. Um, and so a few, a few bills of note that passed or, or didn't of particular concern for the purposes of tonight's hearing, Senate Bill 714, which would have, um, depending on how you characterize it, had added preemptions to the short-term rental or at least specifically enumerated what our powers were, um, failed ultimately. It passed in the Senate. It was sent to the House and passed in the House with an amendment that took away some of the language the Senate bill had written. The Senate rejected that amendment. The two chambers could not come to an agreement, and that was quite a bit of back and forth on Friday, the final day of session, trying to make that come to pass, and it did not. Um, so Senate Bill 714 is not a factor for our discussions tonight. Um, we're not waiting to see if the governor will sign it. It did not pass. Um, there were several press statements and public statements made that the issue will be revisited. Um, whether those statements were made or not, it should be no surprise. Some version of this bill has been on the, on the docket each year for at least like the last five years um, in varying degrees of preemption. So that one should not be of much surprise. Another bill that passed was Senate Bill 102 that passed early in session. That's what's been called as the Live Local Act and, and affordable housing. It has some added preemptions there for uh, affordable housing and, and notwithstanding what may, what may be stated in a comp plan or other ordinances or regulations. So communities are starting to um, adapt to that and determine what it means. Candidly, given some of the limits of affordable housing, perhaps of less import here, uh, given the limits of land that you have and the cost of land and development. Um, however, um, some of the things that uh, it does have, it has to be built on commercial, industrial, or multi-use land, which you do have. Um, if, it can, if affordable housing can be achieved on that land, you are allowed to build, and, and I may mix up some of the things here, um, but you're allowed to build to the highest elevation permissible within a mile, I believe, of that zoning district or three floors whichever is higher, and there's a number of limitations like this. Um, so that's something that we'll be uh, monitoring. Another bill of particular import that we discussed, that I discussed rather, in previous reports is Senate Bill 170. Senate Bill 170 is the bill that will require us after October 1st, if signed by the governor, to have economic impact statements with each ordinance we adopt. It will also create grounds for getting attorney's fees when challenging a local ordinance on the ground that it's arbitrary, unreasonable, or preempted. Um, and so um, we may see some added challenges to municipal enactments, if not in this community and others. Um, the, that, that challenge, uh, any, any litigation challenging an ordinance also serves to abate at least the challenged element of that ordinance. Um, so meaning that you can't enforce it during the pendency of that challenge. Um, so we will see how that plays out, but that is an added preemption. One of the sponsors of that bill, I believe it was that bill that's uh, characterized it as the preemption to end all preemptions. Um, so you can see the direction of where things were going um, this session. Another bill that passed was Senate Bill 250, I believe it was. One second, let me just check my notes. Uh, yeah, I believe it was Senate Bill 250, and Senate Bill 250 um, effective January 1st, 2023, local, if signed by the governor, it did pass both chambers. Local governments located in areas designated by FEMA or Hurricane Ian and Nicole cannot raise their building inspection fees um, before October 1st, 2024. Also, a county or municipality located entirely or partially within 100 miles of where either Hurricane Ian or Nicole made lounge <coughs> landfall cannot propose or adopt any construction moratoria, uh, any um, Restrictive, more restrictive or burdensome, uh, I can't tell you precisely what that means, um, amendment to its comprehensive plan or land development regulations or propose or adopt more restrictive or burdensome procedures concerning site plan review and the like 
and that is going to be made retroactive to September 28, 2022, the date that Ian made landfall. Um, we are with, just within the 100 mile radius, um, I believe, I, I have a loose graphic that I've looked at. Landfall is recorded as being in Cape Costa, um, which is down towards Lee County and that area. So um, anyhow, we'll see if the governor signs that bill. But suffice to say, legislative session brought a new slew of preemptions. Those are not all of them. Those are just some of note. Um, as, the, as we start having all the seminars and continuing educations that do legislative roundups, we'll get a better sense of what's out there. The challenge with any kind of new legislation is it, it passes and then we get to figure out what it means um, and then what that impact means in our individual communities. So while the language may say one thing, how it's administered may be another. Um, and so we will be navigating that in the coming months. Uh, one, you may see a heavier docket of ordinances in the next few months as we try to get things done without the need for economic impact statements attendant to those should the governor sign Senate Bill 170. Um, outside of that, of course, we have the second and final reading of our short-term rental ordinance tonight. Um, and I thank you all, and I, I really truly do mean all those who are on Zoom or have attended previous meetings, the, the, the attending public, emails from residents, um, and, and input. All of you have been a part of this process. Thank you for that, commissioners. Thank you for your careful consideration of this uh, issue, and I look forward to bringing this dialogue to an end tonight. Um, but other than that, I have no other reports. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Randy? Does anyone have any questions for Randy tonight? Okay, we'll move on to the city manager, Greg. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you. Uh, the code enforcement first. Uh, there were three courtesy letters that were sent out for missing house numbers on houses. Uh, 21 violation letters, 18 were trash violations, one license, short term rental, one unlicensed short term rental, uh, two citations for missing house numbers, uh, five notices to appear, four were trash, and one was an issue with a motor home. And then they did uh, six short term rental inspections, five passed, one fell. There was 106 parking citations written for the month, that, and that does not include the other early members of the sheriff's office. Um, capital projects, the phase one of the Nature Preserve World War project is complete. And as I indicated in the uh, budget hearing last year, that's going to be a multi multi year effort to renovate that boardwalk. Cold Park, the fencing and upgrades are complete uh, across the street. That included new fencing and nets and windscreens at the tennis and pickleball courts. Uh, next month, I'll be in a position to give a more detailed report on the Gut Boulevard Phase 2 underground project. We made some real headway with that project, so the public will begin to see some, um, some work from the intersection north, and I'll give more details about that next month. And lastly, um, uh, since there seems to be some focus on traveling and spending money, I had the pleasure of traveling with Cookie to Tallahassee for two days. Um, if you've never gone to uh, Tallahassee to sit through committee and Senate hearings, um, good luck to you. Um, I, I learned a lot while I was up here. I've, I've done a lot of lobbying in my, in my career for the different cities uh, in, at the state and at the federal level. You know, it's always educational. It, was, uh, it, was, it, it didn't let us down. It was educational. And, and we uh, had the opportunity to visit with a lot of elected officials up there. Cookie did a great job. Uh, the fight will continue. You know, we've been fighting this fight since I got here in 2013, after the 2011 law was passed, and we fought it every year. And it'll be, it'll be back next year. It'll be it's, it's an annual thing. But we'll continue the fight. And I want to go ahead and admit something for the record tonight, Cookie. So when the when a public information request is made, that I'm just going to admit this now. When we were leaving, uh, after spending four hours at a Senate uh, committee hearing. And, and leave, and I, I need to admit, admit to the public that Cookie and I dr went through a drive through at a McDonald's and I splurged and got a frozen Coke. So when that comes up later, I just want to go ahead and admit that to you now that I, I, went, I went outside what I should have spent. I should have just got a regular Coke and I spent a few cents more. So instead of that coming up next month, I'll go ahead and admit that now. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Does anyone have any comments or questions for Greg? Any comments? Okay. Thank you, Greg. We'll start with the commission and Commissioner McCall. Do you have any 
uh, comments or events you want to mention this <coughs> month? I do. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I just uh, did give a little update from, from the homeowners as we talked about it. Um, you know, one of the major fundraisers wasn't able to happen this year with Peach Fest. Um, however, I did want to highlight um, all the work of the volunteers for the for the homeowners uh, association. Um, basically, it's from the Easter egg hunt, which unfortunately I was unable to attend. But they estimated they had over 200 children um, for that event, which is fantastic. Um, sponsored by um, a local business here, Century 21 Beggins. They've been the sponsor of that event, uh, helped fund that event for quite a while along with the city of Indian Rocks Beach, um, helping us put that together. Um, basically, it was just games, face painting, and the new bunny. Um, and actually, uh, that's played by uh, Damon Yokely from Chicago Jacks. So, you should stop and thank him, because I don't know anybody who would want 200 kids on their lap and a day, but that's all him. Um, but even though they were a little light on the fundraising, uh, they did approve to donate $1,500 to the Clearwater Marine Aquarium Protect the Next program. Um, basically purchased uh, 10 plaques, so it must be a fundraiser they're doing. Uh, the 10 plaques are going to be placed by sea turtle nests up and down the beach uh, as, the, as they find them every day. Um, and they said look for the plaques with unique engraved messages from all of the IRB Home Board of Directors. So that'll be something to look out for as we're walking down the beach. They also donated $500 to the Seminole Middle School PTSA, uh, $500 to the Seminole Middle Color Garden, and $1,000 to the Seminole High School Marching Band Boosters. Um, also approved a $1,000 donation to Vacation Donations. Um, and um, Another $500 is going to support um, another nonprofit here in town that does a lot of great work in the Rotary and their flag ceremony. Um, and then currently they are working with the Little League to help purchase kitchen equipment to update the snack shack at Camp Longfield. Other than that, they're not doing anything, I don't think. <laughs> so, uh, not a bad report. Um, and bottom line, uh, as we've talked before, between the Homeowners Association, Rotary, A2K, it's all run by volunteers from our community and surrounding community. So we thank them for everything they do. Thank you, Commissioner McCall. Commissioner Hosper? I have nothing to report this month. Thank you. We'll start with um, Commissioner Vaughn. Would you like to make a report? Uh, after our last uh, city meeting, I took the time and actually communicated with uh, Captain Liner uh, regarding the uh, sound uh, decimal meter uh, sound system and uh, the process for understanding noise at uh, different levels, uh, how the officers are going to be using this system, and that uh, I'm correct in the assumption that all of our PM officers will be trained on this. Uh, process by the end of May uh, to help us uh, deal with the noise issue. Uh, a reasonable personal standard will always be one of the foundations, uh, but the meter does play a viable role in this as well. Uh, what uh, on another point? Uh, I spoke with Greg. I'm asking that in the very near future we revisit uh, Indian Rocks Beach parking <coughs> and Indian Rocks uh, Beach speed limits uh, throughout the internal neighborhoods uh, for safety with the number of walkers and simply the volume of traffic uh, since the last time we sat down and spoke about this. Which brings up, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I haven't actually had a chance to read the email yet, but I got it, um, about coordinating 
how we regulate light for turtles. Um, you know, what, what the suggested lighting levels are for turtles and how we approach that. Um, and it's really principally going to be on the, obviously, golf side of golf. Um, I think that that's something I'd like to look at with the city in terms of making recommendations for condo associations and whatnot that might be a little more helpful than what we have now. Uh, you know, the, the uh, Clearwater Marine, uh, they actually have a little presentation. And maybe that would be a good idea to have them come uh, to the commission meeting. They can tell you what the condos, they can actually show you, they have a presentation or show you the ones that have issues, the ones that don't on Indian Rocks Beach. And I will tell you, Indian Rocks Beach were actually in fairly good shape. But maybe, would you like that? You know, so they Well, I'm, I'm surrounded by condos where I live. Okay. And their lights are very bright. Okay. Uh, and I think that, I don't know whether it's like a motion detection thing that might be helpful or if somehow we can just ramp it down or make them whatever amber light that they are and other things. But well, they it's really be been very severe. Too. Exactly. You know, everything. Just throwing that out on the, the porch here. How about if we have uh, the clerk call and see if we can get them on, you know, the soon, whatever the next meeting is or the meeting after that to come and they'll give us all of the information that we need. Okay. Thank you. Is that it? Yeah. Anything else? No, that's just turtles. Okay. Good deal. It's turtles. Just want to mention that it's Mother's Day this weekend, so anyone who's a mentor or a mother or an aunt or a sister or has helped a child and, and, and been a good person, I hope you have a great day. Uh, we did go to uh, Tallahassee and it was an experience, but there were, in all of the hundreds of thousands of letters, um, we I was in correspondence with one of uh, our representatives and just we had a, we had a really uh, good trip. There were frustrating times, but um, I, I think that every little bit helped. And um, so we prevailed uh, this time. And as we know, that it will be back, um, I'm sure. So uh, we'll continue with what we're doing. That's, that's what we have to do. So I appreciate all of you, all the calls we got, people stopping us. Um, just, you know what, we're going to continue to do the good work that we, we do. And with that, we're going to move on to the, um, are there any ad additions or deletions tonight? Hearing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, Randy, would you read the consent agenda? Happy Madam Mayor, there are four items on the consent agenda. Item A, approval of the March 1st, 2023 City Commission Work Session Minutes. Item B, approval of the March 28, 2023 City Commission Meeting Minutes. Item C, Accept and file the March 2023 year-to-date financial report. And item D, authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with Planetaria for the design and implementation of a new city website. These are the four items on the consent agenda, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Randy. And is there a motion? I'll make a motion to accept the consent agenda. And is there a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. We'll move on to our public hearing tonight, which is 6A, ordinance number 2023-02. This is a second and final reading. Randy, would you please read the ordinance? Happy Madam Mayor, this is ordinance 2023-02. An ordinance of the City of Indian Rocks Beach, Florida, establishing a comprehensive regulatory scheme regarding marketing and operation of short-term rentals within the city, creating a new Article 5 vacation rental regulations within Chapter 18 businesses, Establishing a comprehensive ordinance regulating the registration, inspection, safety, and operation of vacation rentals within specified zoning districts in the city of Indian Rocks Beach. Creating related definitions, making related findings, providing for codification, severability, and for an effective date. This has been a reading of Ordinance 2023-02 by title only on the second and final reading, Madam Mayor. Um, and commissioners, I should tell you that at your desk you have a, a new version stamped as being circulated this morning. That was just to address a typographical issue uh, where one place it had said the, the number spelled out 10 and then wrote 12 in parentheses or the inverse. I just cleaned up that, that minor oversight in the draft. Um, but otherwise, it is, it is otherwise uh, identical in its, in its other respects. Okay, does, uh, does anyone have any questions for Randy as we begin this agenda item? No questions at this time. In, in recap, um, 
you know, as they say on all the Netflix shows, on the last episode of, um, on the last episode of, you folks went through this draft in full. Uh, you gave me some consensus directions. Notable issues were the how you chose to address the swimming pool issues, the bringing the CT district back into the ordinance. Um, those all those things that were announced at the conclusion of the last meeting on consent or on consensus. Um, we got some input, for example, also from the from the Pinellas Suncos Fire Rescue District on language on the fire prevention code. We, we brought that language in. So this draft incorporates the revisions from last time. There were a few minor changes that were not specifically discussed in consensus that were just really um, operational in nature. One, for example, uh, somebody raised the concern about call complaints um, and, and the violation emanating from a complaint and failure to respond, but it didn't say the call came from, making it more explicit that the call must come from the city, its agents, or, or de its, its authorized agents or officials, including PCSO, the fire district, etc. So those were the limited changes made uh, between drafts. And otherwise, uh, this is for discussion for final adoption and review. You have, of course, in the intervening month, received additional public comments, public suggestions, whether those be on your way to Publix or in, the, in your inbox or in your e email. But um, if you wish to address anything else in this draft, Tonight is the night. Uh, this is where we will be um, codifying this. I, I want to make clear for both the, the commission and the um, attending public or observing public that the, um, the, the ordinance itself contemplates a rollout period. Uh, staff will need time to develop the forms contemplated, etc. Uh, one of the other elements that we'll talk about at the conclusion of this hearing, should you adopt the ordinance, is the resolution for the fees, um, which will be on the next meeting's draft. Um, so those are some of the other elements that this leaves open, but that is where we stand for the benefit of those attending and the commission so you know what we're deliberating at this point. One more time, are there any questions for um, the city manager or for the attorney before we go out and I open the public comment? Well, I, I do have a question. Um, on page 16 of 25, um, under the maximum occupancy based on site capacity, We've said the maximum overnight occupancy of a vacation home unit. And I think what we were trying to preempt is that we don't want to have events and parties anymore. We want to, we want to pretty much stop as many party houses as we can. So I'd like to propose that and ask Randy if we remove the word overnight, does that help us? by precluding that we're, they're going to have seven more people over. Does that say then the max occupancy is 12? I don't know that I can answer this question any, any differently than I answered it in the past, uh, okay. which is to say that occupancy violations, occupancy restrictions in short-term rental or transient lodging establishment ordinances like this one are typically enforced on the advertising side more than the actual present occupancy in the moment. Yeah. In fact, when we go back to our workshops, before we even had a draft ordinance, you had a code inspector from another jurisdiction come and tell you, we've never once written one for that way. The, the, and, and last week I was in um, another jurisdiction, I was giving training to code, inspecting, code inspector officials across the state. And under chapter 162, a code inspector is the only person who can initiate code enforcement proceedings and they must have personal knowledge. Um, so the fact that your neighbor calls and says, I saw 15 people is not enough. The code inspector needs to, and then they need to establish that those people are in fact occupants and they're not somebody who just says, oh no, I'm just dropping off the Uber order, I'll be going soon, the Uber Eats order or something of the sort. And so, generally speaking, can you strike the overnight language? Yes, you can. Will it substantively change the fact that there are, oh, there's 15 people in that building in this moment and we can reasonably expect that there are going to be violations issued? Highly unlikely, as a matter of practice, and, and that's not. I'm not. I'm just making sure you understand, so you have reasonable expectations of what you're legislating. Uh, what this seeks to regulate is the overnight occupancy. If you want to make that occupancy, you certainly can. That comes with all the attendant issues of a proving that violation, b regulating and and, and limiting that. We've, we've had that um, issue of you know, is, if you can have what is the intensity to the use in the community? If you can have a pool party next door that has 20 people and they can have 12, is that really, you know, and that's a, a policy decision for you folks to make. I'm not telling you 
um, how to resolve that, but I, I don't know that I have much more to add than much of the discourse on this issue. Does that answer your question? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I want to be thorough. Okay. <laughs> Can you strike it? Yes. Are there issues with doing so? Yes, if, you're, if your belief will be that by striking that, no short-term rental in Indian Rock Speech will have more than that number. I can't promise you that by a function of its language. Denise, anything else? That's it, then. Joe? Uh, just a real quick uh, question on Greg, and I know you may have taken a hiatus with, with coming down the state, but um, kind of how's our talks going with the software? Are we still looking into that as far as the management software? Do you want the host compliant? Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, um, we're ongoing discussions with the with the host compliance company that, that I intend to do business with. I put that on hold until the ordinance is adopted and we, we uh, there's been a definite decision about what districts this applies to because the fee or the amount that we would pay is by parcel. Okay. So in other words, if it's the whole city, it's a pretty large number. But if it's based on what the current ordinance is, which is the three resident, residential and the CT, then I will get them to give us a quote for that information. Because I won't have, I won't have a need for, for example, the business district, because the business district is not regulated really by that. And, and realistically, by the time the ordinance is adopted, say if it's adopted tonight, we take the next couple of months to implement forms and procedures and for example, our two code enforcement uh, employees and Lauren, who works with them, are going to need to be trained by brand new staff on the magistrate process and how that works. By the time we do that, you know, I'm actively working on the budget, um, so I, I, I expect us to really start to use that program uh, probably about the time we adopt the new budget. It didn't have some level of customer service with it too. It did. It did. Logging of uh, complaints because I didn't read that in here. It, 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 it does. It has a, uh, as part of the package, it has a 24 hour number where there's an actual, actual live person that will answer the phone. If you have an issue with the vacation rental, you give them the information and tell them the nature of the, describe the nature of the issue. They have the database of the uh, registered vacation rentals. They'll actually call the 24-hour contact person and say, hey, this is such and such and such and such company. We just had a call about your property. We appreciate your attention to it. And the benefit of that is that uh, that's just the documentation that is then forwarded. Just say if it happens over a weekend. We get some issues on a weekend. The following Monday, they would send code enforcement or report on you know, the activity. And the code enforcement thing, they can do their own follow-up if they need to with the party on the top ten. So, but so yeah, there's a there's a follow-up. Thank you. Anything else, Joe? <coughs> Not for now. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Madam, Madam Mayor. Bond or bond? Bond. Uh, Madam Mayor, I'd like to revisit what uh, uh, Denise was talking about regarding removing. Uh, the word overnight from our standard here. Uh, as I look at our ordinance uh, dealing with uh, section 18-214A, uh, it talks about, quote, permissible occupancy in advertising. I would uh, stand to reason that if we actually remove the word overnight, we make it very clear what the municipal what the permissible occupancy is for the short-term rentals, number one. Uh, number two, we were talking about code enforcement. Historically, uh, we've been told by the sheriff that they will not do code enforcement for us during the evening hours. Uh, that is a city responsibility, but we do have code enforcement officers uh, that are working daylight hours. Uh, number two. Number three is there's a clear difference between 10 and 12 visitors in a short-term rental and 20 to 25. There's an easy noticeable difference and we do have cameras to modify to, to validate this with our magistrate. So given this information I would like to propose that we do strike the word overnight from 
this particular section. Yes, absolutely. You folks are the policymakers. Tell me what you want to do. <laughs> well, you've heard Randy's comments, and you've heard both Denise and Land. Are there any? What is what is the goal of that? What is what is it that we're trying to achieve by striking that word? Uh, <clears throat> what we're trying to do is limit uh, day parties in these particular houses. I live down the street from a particular home on Harbor Drive and I vote out to the uh, to the to the beaches and when I vote out to the beaches I notice that one of these homes, several of these homes, have enough seating bars and chairs in one residence to literally house 30, 40 people. And I think what we're doing house. is, uh, well, not house, but literally have parties with 30 to 40 people. <coughs> I mean, Randy, what's the best way we limit that? To not have 30 or 40 people in a house. The question is, what is the best way to limit it so you don't have 30 and 40 people in a house? During the day. During daytime hours. Um, you can set a restriction on it. I, 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 my, my lack of words on the matter is really because I don't have much more to add to the topic. I, I think I've explained it as best I can, what its, what its practical limitations are as a matter of practice. You know, we, we've talked about that, you know, understanding that they are isolated instances, this community is accustomed, like many communities in our country, are accustomed to some nights, there's, you know, whether it's Super Bowl Sunday, you know, the boat parade, insert issue here, where it's not uncommon, the holidays just generally, uh, it's not uncommon to have multiple people in your home. I, you know, I have a, uh, a, a comfortable home and I've had fundraisers at my house. I've you know, told the neighbors and I've cost them counted for parking, I was considerate. Um, but I've had those functions at my home, and, and you're, you know, what you're proposing here is to say that um, in, a, in a transient or short-term rental being used in that function, that you're going to be limited to 12 occupants. I would give you the example of, you know, well, to the extent these are being equated to hotels, I grew up going to hotels for tournaments, for sports and the like, and while they, we had to sign up and say four people were sleeping here, during the day, you might have 12 kids in that room while you know two parents were signed up for when they drew the short straw and had to watch everybody in one room. Um, it's not uncommon to have an, a daytime occupancy that exceeds what you're doing overnight. If you're trying to use that analogy, that's one thing to consider. I understand the concern uh, Member Vaughn is trying to address, um, and ultimately that is a decision for you, the policymakers, to make. I, I can't give you if I had a very simple solution to that problem. Trust and believe I wouldn't be meetings until 9 and 10 p.m. every night. Um, so uh, it's left for you folks as the policymakers to decide how you wish to regulate that. Greg. I just want to give a practical example of what we may run into. And there you go. Okay. The my disclaimer is like Randy's is we'll attempt to enforce whatever y'all put in the ordinance. But this is just say that you do it. And we get a call at City Hall or, or the 1-800 number gets a call. And somebody goes, uh, the house next door to me allegedly has 24 people there. And then I send it, I dispatch a, a code enforcement officer over to whatever the address is. They pull up to the house, they go to the front door, they knock on the front door, and they say, We've had a complaint about, to say if that's, if that's a cap, to say that there's more than two people here. A code enforcement officer has no ability to, to be in a position to validate that one way or the other because a code enforcement officer cannot go in a gate through a door to count heads to to, to, to determine the number of people now uh, you know I'm trying to think you know most of the houses that we have in Indian Rocks Beach have 
you know, six foot fences all the way around, particularly as they have pools, there's just no fences. So most calls that we would receive, if we went out and we tried to validate, are they close to the number or whatever the number, there's really no way to do it because um, unless we can just see in the, a backyard, uh, you know, then we might have a shot at it. But, you know, when we started this conversation in November, one of the comments I made was, is it, and went back to the disclaimer, is that we will at attempt to enforce every sentence, every article of whatever the, whatever the ordinance is, but I also want to manage expectations of on the ground reality. And I'm just, just putting that out there that if you, if you put these kind of caps, and that's the reason why you're doing it, on occasion we may can enforce that, but in most cases knowing how homes and fences are arranged and knowing the limitations of what a code enforcement person can and can't do, I just want y'all to understand that. Uh, because what's going to happen is, what I pr predict would happen is if you, if you do it and then we begin to implement the ordinance after we got everything set up, then we'll have people at city commission meetings that say, well, I personally saw 23 people in the backyard of a house and then I'll respond, we went, we went over, we knocked on the door, we talked to the occupant of the house indicated that we thought there was a problem and that's probably going to be the extent of it because we have no legal ability to count, 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 count heads. Heads. Yeah. Okay. Or for that matter, help detain and halt people out. Who are we, how are we going to try to who's, you know, and, and I'm not suggesting that's what you're, I'm, I, I'm not trying to set up a straw man. Yeah. I, again, it's just explaining the, the, the expectation of it. And, and let me say this to you. Um, you know, I worked on ordinances for a long time, decades. And I know in some ordinances, things are put in some ordinances in hopes that people will abide by what the expectations are. And a lot of people would, you know, most people, in the, when we deal with people, and this is not, this is true for every city I've ever worked in, the majority of people that you have interaction with over a code enforcement issue are going to comply. So, you know, sometimes people will say, let's just put it in there, but, but I want to be real with you about you can put that in there, but then on the other side of it, how some people read ordinances, if, if, if it's in black and white, that's what is expected. And I just want to be clear on what you can expect if it does put in there. Well, what about if we added the words daytime and overnight? It's the same result. Um, Commissioner, it's, it's, it's the same result in terms of you take overnight out and you put daytime and overnight in, it's the same result subject to the same practical limitations that have been discussed. I, I don't think adding that word substantively, it, it changes when its scope of applies as it's written now, but you can do that by striking the word overnight. So in either case, it's for a consensus of this body to decide how it wishes to resolve that, that dispute or debate. Madam Mayor. Yes, sir. Okay, if uh, if we can't do that, then I would uh, suggest we revisit section 18214A and look for a better definition for permissible occupancy. A doesn't have the definitions section of it simply reads uh, no vacation rental may be advertised as an event venue for gatherings likely or intended to draw attendance in excess of the permissible occupancy and parking restrictions on the property such as weddings corporate retreats or film productions um, you can add overnight there I, I it would be consistent but I, I, again I, I don't know that it's I think I think what I'm looking for is more daytime uh, addressing daytime and I'll be honest with you. Uh, what is the permissible occupancy? Is it the nighttime quota that we've established? Is We're, it the reading the ordinance as a whole? Yes. Okay. So, on the advertising as on the advertising aspect, where we're painting everything day and night, but on the actual ordinance, we're only paying on section. 
Well, it's in 216, we're only stating overnight. So does permissible occupancy only deal with overnight? Or does it deal with daytime? in this context within section 214. Administering this ordinance the way it's written, you would read it as we say in the law, in peri materia, giving meaning to everything. The only occupancy limitation within this is set forth in 18216, uh, subject to the vesting period, of course. And so you would, you would apply that and say that an advertisement that is likely to draw in excess of that 10, 12 or 14 or 10 or 12, depending on the moment, um, number, it would be an advertisement in violation. If it says, come, can accommodate 15, it would be in violation of the code um, as written. Okay. Um, and, and that would be completely consistent with all the language. That's not a, a stretch of drafting. Um, okay. So that would be how that would be administered in practice. Okay. That makes sense. Is everyone clear? Mm -hmm. as, yes. as we go forward? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is there any other part of this ordinance that you would like to address before we go out to the public? I have a quick question. Yes. yes. Um, is there, and you know, maybe it's in here somewhere and I didn't notice, but a mechanism for relief for non-conforming properties? And that this is something that Joe brought up a couple of months ago regarding some, and this is one of the things with the CT zone, that a lot of little cottages, for example, on the C, the CT zone are not conforming to a lot of the things that we've built into this now. What is the mechanism for relief for those properties, for example? So two things before we move on from that, um, if, it, if it, please, uh, Member Vaughn or the commission, we can add to that language uh, in 18214A, and I will take your question. Yeah. Um, gatherings like the should draw in excess of the permissible occupancy as set forth in this ordinance or as set forth in 18216 to make it more explicit yes. to yes. avoid yes. that. Um, yes. We can definitely do that. Um, so if there's consensus direction, um, the you know that, that language will be added. So um, to draw attention in the excess of the permissible act occupancy as set forth in section 18216 of this ordinance or of this um, article. As set forth in section 18216 of this of this article, um, this article has the whole ordinance in it, and parking restrictions on the property. Um, I would say permissible occupancy and parking restrictions as set on the property, comma, as set forth in section 18216 of this article, such as um, wedding and, and otherwise. Um, and I would I would add 18216 and whatever the code section is that sets forth the parking limitation. I would just add those two sections to make that explicit. Um, before we pivot into, is there consensus direction for that addition? Everybody yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So that, that will be considered part of this um, ordinance and will still go to public comment. Um, um, but as it relates to Member Vaughn's question, Member Vaughn's question was about non-conforming structures. Uh, when you go back to, in as much as occupancy flows from bedrooms, um, and you go back to the language on bedrooms. Um, What's the page on that? Page four. What page is that? Uh, um, I'm, I'm getting there, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to see if I got the language back. I'm sure. Yeah. The language on bedrooms is there. For purposes of this article, staff, staff shall have discretion in the registration process to determine the number of bedrooms within traditional cottages that exist within the city that may not have a built-in closet owing to their historical design. So that's one way that we do that, that there is acknowledgement of that and, and you know, for those non-conforming properties as you've described them. Um, there are various carve-outs in this code as it relates to the CT district. For example, for exterior signs, there's a carve-out there that it, it's not required given that the way that those properties are designed. The same is true of parking, that they don't have to do special parking. So I don't know if your question was more particular to another element that I'm not addressing, but those are some of the, the carve-outs in this code as it relates to that, um, the unique features of that district. I just, I just, I think that's great. I want to make sure that we're... I, got, I, got a, I had a conversation about the non-conforming with the, on CT2 with the old cottages, so that was good. Okay, good. Anything else, John? Uh, yeah, actually, I got two. Uh, I'm actually to piggyback exactly where uh, Jude was going. Um, one thing we didn't consider when we added back CT, um, 
was with the cottages. Now those cottages are on, they're in both zones. Right? I mean, we have some at the end of my street. There's a whole line right across from Cooper Coconut. Um, but I, I would suggest or recommend that we not only put that card out for bedrooms, but also on the parking requirements. Because those houses were traditional with garages and spaces and the way they were built in the 30s or 20s. And, um, and note that would also be on the ones on residential areas. Uh, yeah. It, it, and like I say, it's, it's, it gives the city discretion to look, you know, I mean, we all know which cottages we have in town. You know, I really don't want to give any more incentive to tear them down yes. um, than we have had in the past. Uh, they're disappearing at an alarming rate anyway. Um, so I don't think it's that much of a carve out for the city to, to look if it's a if it's a three bedroom and it's, there's only two spaces in the in the driveway and there's no garage. How do we you know, institutionalize that? Can the can the city make the decision? So it's and, and forgive me because I you know I, I am a contractor. I, I don't I don't live in your city. Um, it's my understanding that when you're saying cottages, we're referring to cottages which are designated as such. They're, they're, they're readily identifiable. Right. There's no ability for somebody to, to claim my home is a cottage. It's a readily identifiable feature. And so what we could do to answer Member Vaughn's question about how do we, how do we codify that is in, as it relates specifically to parking, on page 20 of 25, it says this provision, as it relates to minimum parking requirements within 18, uh, section 18218, at the bottom of the page, it says this provision shall not be construed to require the modification of any existing parking infrastructure of any condominium property in the city's CT domain district where the condominium property contains units lawfully operating as short-term vacation rentals. What we can do is within that sentence act where it says um, any condominium property in the city's CT zoning district or historically recognized or, or, or um, what's the language we have in the bedroom one? Mirror the language from the bedroom one, right. adding cottage, basically. So in bedroom where it says a... Um, City staff shall have the discretion. Yeah, and historical design. Okay, so maybe not mirroring that language, but just saying, or to cottage properties within the discretion of city staff. Right. Um, and, and that way there's... Um, well, hold on a second. Well, and that's why I'm saying give me a moment to, to figure out the language because adding within the discretion of staff might be broader than that clause. So I would just say the city CT zoning district or properties traditionally recognized as cottages within the city of Indian Rocks Beach, um, where the condominium property or, or cottage contains units lawfully operating a short-term vacation rental. Would that language work for the concern that's been raised? Yes. I think that's great as long as we can agree what a cottage is. Well, you that's know, I mean, I know that you were saying, you know, as long as we all agree, but that's, it's a... Well, so again, I'm going to defer a little bit to your staff here. There's, I, it's my understanding that these are not, you know, we, though there's been discussion about it, not every cottage is on some kind of historical registry, so I can't point to that. Right. Um, and there's a little bit of an everybody knows what we're talking about thing here, um, but I, and I'm not trying to add three and four more definitions to the ordinance and, and all these tiers of things, so I'll ask Greg if he has some wisdom or insight on this um, issue. I'm not so sure about the wisdom. <laughs> uh, that, that's something we handle administratively. I mean, okay. we, know the, we know what a cottage is. We know a cottage is not a house that was built a year ago. We, we know what they are. So, and then like any other ordinance, there's no way to define down to every term. Yeah, and I can assure you, we, we know what the cottages are across the whole world. So I would be adding language um, in that, that clause on the bottom of page 20, um, 18 to 18, where it says, of any condominium property in the CCT zoning district or properties historically recognized as a cottage in the city, where the condominium property or cottage contains units lawfully operating as short-term vacation rentals. And I think that addresses the concern that the, that the commission is, is raised. Thank you. Are we all Thank you, Randy. Absolutely. All right, there's general yes. consensus in that regard. Our, um, I believe uh, member uh, 
Um, the call I had before, Chair, Mayor. Uh, yeah, and just want to open kind of back for discussion. Um, with when it comes to occupancy, there's a in my brain I'm having. Can you just talk into the mic? I'm sorry. Purposes? My my apologies. I was talking to myself. I think. Um, so <laughs> never mind. Where am I at? Um, so just when it comes to occupancy, um, and speaking to city staff, there's approximately twenty. Don't quote me on an exact number, but approximately 20 houses that are max of 10 occupancy in the neighborhoods is going to be much less than, or not much less, but less than their bedroom count. Um, so I would like to discuss, given the different laws we deal with here. Um, if we grandfather those particular houses that can be identified with legal bedrooms five or above at the time of adoption, not not build them from here till three years from now, um, houses that are five and above would have a maximum of twelve grandfathered in instead of reverting back to the ten within two years. If that makes sense. Because bottom line, you're taking a five year in our current ordinance it's two plus or two bedroom, right? Plus two common. So in a five bedroom house, which we do have those, right? That's twelve folks. Twelve folks in a I mean you're probably talking at three thousand thirty five hundred square foot home, right? If not more. Um, they can accommodate that. Um, a six bedroom can accommodate that. Not that we want parties, not that you want large, you know, um, family, or you do want large families, <laughs> but not that we want large parties. Um, but in my mind, there is a, if I currently have a six bedroom house, now you're telling me I can only have 10 people in there, including children. We didn't make any provision for six year olds or something like that that the other cities did. You're talking a six bedroom, 4,000 square foot house with 10 people, right? Um, as I've said before, I'm not looking for monster houses to be built with 5,000 or 10 rooms in them. Um, however, since we're going down this path today and making this ordinance, um, which we may have challenges with that, um, making a grandfather for a few particular houses maybe a decent idea, in my opinion. Does anyone have any comments? Just quickly. Yes. Um, I think we we're <coughs> trying to sunset that on to some degree with the 12 over two years, and I understand the language is a little squishy here, but the it's a real issue, though, because, again, you, if people have purchased into a situation with expectations of the future, you don't want to deny that expectation either, because that would get us into all sorts of other trouble. Um, right. Yeah. So it's... Sorry you had to do this, Joe, but here we go. Uh, it's, uh, it, 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 in my, my particular opinion, we're, op I mean, we were, we're obligated to discuss it. Because we there's ramifications in the future, possibly for our city in this particular fashion. Um, so, I, in my mind, good or bad, consensus either way. Greg, it, do you have any comments? Just at least <coughs> discussion. Turn to Randy. I was going to ask Greg first. Greg. Yeah. Okay, Randy. Yeah. 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 In as much as I understand the question, I think the question is. Should we do this? And ultimately, a should question is up to you folks. Um, as I, I had a version of this conversation with, I don't even remember which one of you, and my advice at the time was the, the less restrictive you get, the less problems you have, obviously. When I say problems, I mean legal challenges. And I'm not saying that's always a basis for doing it, it's just the answer to the question. 
Um, the question I, I think that the proposal, if I'm understanding it more succinctly, is if a house has five bedrooms or more, uh, which Member McCall believes could be in the neighborhood of 20 homes within the uh, identified districts, is 12 or 10, depending on which district it's even in, too restrictive? Um, and so should we make some permission that any home um, in existence as of the time of the adoption of this ordinance shall have an occupancy limitation of X, whatever that number is that, the, that you folks wish to, to take, whether you should or shouldn't is a policy decision and I'm not going to resolve that, um, but I will tell you that it is added um, recognition of people's um, as, as, as Member Bond alluded to, their investment expectations, but and, and also a recognition of the practicality that that space, you're not, as, as the term has been used at some of these prior hearings, shoving people in a smaller space. That space can, if based on assumed square footages and the like, likely accommodate that occupancy comfortably. Um, so ultimately, that's a call for you folks. Right, and just real briefly, I mean, the one thing also, I mean, just We've done such a great job of defining bedrooms, um, putting inspections in place. We've already found illegal bedrooms or build outs. Um, so that's not what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about a true five bedroom house or a true six bedroom house when she was built. Um, it's just my, like I said, just, it's just a concern that. Even if, you know, I mean, there's uh, there's conflict in my mind in that. Land, you want to say something um, about that? I, I think at this point in time, if we choose to do this, we're going backwards. I think we had this similar discussion at the last uh, city council meeting, and that was why we added the two-year time frame for an investor to recoup their investment. Uh, I think if we do this, we're going to open the door for people coming and scraping houses and then building more and saying, they have it, why don't we have it? And that's why I said that there will be at the time of adoption. I'm, I'm aware. aware. I'm aware and of that. So, I mean, that's our, and Randy could probably answer that maybe better than I. Um, yeah, I mean, they wouldn't have a reasonable expectation if the matter is restricted for new construction. That's not a reasonable um, investment backed expectation at that point because it's already been regulated prior to the time of investment. So um, that argument to me legally is less persuasive. I can't tell you how a court would rule on anything ever. Again, if I could, I'd be elsewhere. But the the um, the idea that um, you know if you make this permission and put some boundaries on it for a, a vesting period, whether that be you know any any home presently in existence at this time um and you you eliminate i think the the reasonable reliance on oh but i thought if i built it afterwards i'd be able to rent just like that to answer the legal question again the policy question is yours why don't uh why don't we go to the commission on this we, we heard joe and we heard land Joe would like to add and have a grandfather of the 12. Did he? What's your? How do you fit that in? I don't want to change it. Okay. Two. I recognize the difficulty in this one for sure. Yes. I don't necessarily want to change anything, but I do want to recognize that this is a real issue. And if there's a way to resolve it this evening smoothly, that would be awesome. <laughs> I won't hurt your vibe, bro. <laughs> Yay or nay? I already pushed for the two years, so I'll just go ahead and say it's five minutes. 
Nancy Obarski, 708 Beach Trail. I have um, more questions, and actually, City Manager Mims makes a good point in that some of this stuff is going to be really tough to enforce. I'm in a CT zone, and I, I came to a meeting about maybe 10 years ago complaining about the Airbnb that's two doors for me with four units. And basically, what I was told is you live in, you bought a place in a CT zone. That's your own problem. And I went home and thought about it, and they were right. I spent $40,000 on new windows, and I couldn't hear the pool table crack, the balls cracking in the middle of the night anymore. So that's how I took care of it. Um, let's say I have a party on my back deck, and I've had them, and there's 35 people on my back deck. Two doors over, I've got an Airbnb with four units. First of all, does that mean they can have 12 people per unit? So we're talking about 48, 48 people over there? And okay, so let's say they do that. They got 48 and I've got 30 and uh, somebody calls. And they come to my house first and they say, uh, you can't have any more than 12 people on your deck. What are you doing? How do they know I'm not... I'm not an Airbnb versus my neighbor that's two doors down. I know you have registrations, but are you going to give that to the code enforcer so that they know that I'm not an Airbnb and that and am I allowed to have 30 people? Can you enforce that on an Airbnb but not on me? And you know what I see here is I mean, don't get me wrong, I agree, short-term rentals have not been a positive, but a lot of these rules are just, um, the enforcement angle of it is going to really be tough, and June said it, you know, this is a tough one. So, thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Is there anyone else who'd like to come forward at this time? Good evening. Your name? My name is Marilyn Bush, and I live at 512 Harbor Drive North. And I just have a comment on how this short-term rental debacle has affected me personally. I think that uh, more and more short-term rentals are on my half-mile street. Three more since we last met. Six that I can see from my front door. We are right now having an invasion of the house snatchers. More than ever, we need a proper vacation STR ordinance, and it's essential for the sanity of those of us who have lived here for more than 50 years and have owned our property like we have since 1965 that this is a whole sea change. And I do appreciate your hard work on it, but we are now living the nightmare on our own streets. I used to be welcoming and friendly, and now I'm the crabby old lady down the street. Thank you. Anyone else who'd like to come up at this time? Hi, uh, yes. Rick Welch. We live at 405 12th Avenue in Indian Rocks Beach. My wife and I bought our home here nine years ago um, because it had a nice neighborhood feel to it. And in those nine years, as you all know, it's changed substantially. Um, when you look at the real estate ads in our town now, all the realtors say 
buying at New Rock Beach, where they have no short-term rental rules at all. Every single ad you see now, that's what they, they put out there for folks. Um, as the woman before me said, every home in our area that's selling now, they're all turning them into short-term rentals. And we're seeing a lot of ones that are bigger now, the five-bedroom, six-bedroom ones, where they're starting to convert those into short-term rentals too. So the sooner you can get, I know you've worked hard on this, the sooner something can get in place to kind of start to alleviate this, the better, because the sales right now are just flooding in the terms of short-term rentals. So that's my uh, two cents. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Anyone else would like to come up this time? Kelly. Good evening. My name is Kelly Sisrek. I live at 448 Harbor Drive South. And I just want to, since you're struggling so much on occupancy, just want to speak specifically to that area. Um, in 2011, Florida passed, or I should say they amended Florida Statute 509, and that's when they recognized vacation rentals as a type of lodging business. So they do not have to have the same rules as private homes. They are not residential in nature. They are a transient rental property. So they can, in many cases, should have different rules. Private homes don't sleep two per bedroom in every bedroom. I don't think you're going to find a single private home in any of Rock's Beach with six bedrooms that has 12 permanent occupants with two children sleeping in each bedroom or two adults in each bedroom. So it's a different situation. In 2015, Anna Maria passed some of the strictest occupancy rules in the state of Florida, and their 2015 ordinance holds to this day. Um, they have had some Burt Harris lawsuits. They had to deal with individual properties that were six or seven bedrooms by just negotiating with the individual property owners to establish something that was reasonable. So you, know, you, you can find ways to settle that. I don't think there are that many homes in Indian Rock Beach that currently have six legitimate bedrooms. There are some properties that have converted dining rooms, garage spaces, but I don't think you have very many on the books that actually have six bedrooms. So I hope you consider all that. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Brian, is there anybody on Zoom who'd like to speak? Not at this time, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Hi, John. Hello, hello. Kevin Fansfield, 448 Harbor Drive South. I want to start off by, as people have said before, thanking the board, because this has been a, a struggle in many ways. Also thank our city manager and mayor for going up to Tallahassee. Kelly and I did that too, and they postponed it. So it's not like going here, you know, it's, it's, it's a chore going up there. You never know what you're going to get. I mean, we were there for a six or 10 hour session, I forget, it was really long. Um, and I'd really like to thank the residents who wrote to the Florida legislature, the legislators. There were thousands and thousands of emails and phone calls to those offices. And uh, we were battling a, a pretty substantial foe, and I just can't believe that we prevail on that one. I think we're going to have to be in better shape next year. They're going to be stronger, so we'll talk about that later on. But just be happy that uh, all your good work um, was not thrown out. So, and talking on occupancy, just make a couple notes on that, too. The main reason that uh, Lan and Denise were talking about limiting you know, other than uh, the people that are actually renting it is for party houses. I mean, that is one of the major things we've been at from the beginning. And the second thing, as we all know, is if the renters are informed that they can only have whatever it is, 10 or 12 or 8 or whatever in that property, they're less likely to invite 20 friends over. So, and if they do invite a few people over, it's more likely they're going to be quieter because they know they shouldn't be doing it. So it's not a perfect, uh, perfectly enforceable thing, but that doesn't mean it can't have great value to limit the number of guests, or however you want to say it. I, I got a little confused about what went on there. I think you accomplished the same thing as striking uh, the word overnight. I hope that's the case, because um, we have so many people that are coming to Indian Rock Speech particularly you know, in the summer months, but some of them are too. If you take a look at the renters, oftentimes they have Florida plates. 
And if they're coming from Hillsboro or other parts of Canales or North, then oftentimes they just invite their friends, all their friends down for the weekend. So it's, um, <coughs> I hope you've addressed it in that way, that it is, occupancy is occupancy. And the last thing, just about the comments about how many people, if you have a house with, um, that you allow 14 people in it, that is 700 strangers in that house, in that neighborhood. If you, even if you have 12, it's 600 strangers in that neighborhood. So it's not, we're not just comparing this to residents. If a resident was there, on average, was there two people per house. So it's a huge difference in the load in our community. So I appreciate you doing what you've done. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Is there anyone else that would like to come up before we close the public hearing? Uh, Diane Daniel, 309 10th Avenue. Um, and just Rick, what Rick Walsh, I think is his name, said, it just made me want to think of something that's been on my mind a lot. Um, first of all, thank you all so much and everyone for all the work you've done. It's been incredible. Um, unfortunately, I feel like for people like Rick and many, many, many of us, the fact is that I don't think we're going to see a lot of changes in things like the real estate ads and the prolific can't say that word, and the abundance of uh, short-term rentals because, as we know, you can't control um, the uh, number, or the frequency of rentals, and you can't control the location of rentals. So what you're doing is great, but I also know that you're strapped by the rules. And so sadly, I think that things aren't really going to change that much. I hope that the party houses change, but I think that the abundance of short-term rentals and people cashing out and real estate ads saying cha-ching, and they used to say, imagine your dream home, and now they say, investor's dream. I don't think it's gonna change, and that's sad, and I don't, you know, I think unless something happens on the state level, it won't change, and I think that that's something that I hope people understand, that what you all are doing is great, but it's not a solution to what a lot of people are seeing, which is that they're losing their neighbors, and they're losing their neighborhoods, and they're losing the community that they knew, and so I hope people understand that because you all are doing great, but there's only so much you can do. So thanks for what you've done, but I think that we're not going to see a big difference. Thank you, guys. Anyone else who'd like to come forward? Good evening, Jolene Rusinowski, Kavanaugh, on behalf of my family at 450 Arbor Drive South. We've owned that home for over 30 some years, maybe more. Anyway, I just have some bullet points I just want to go over, and I don't want to go over everything um, that I've already said before in past meetings. On the average census was 2.5 um, in, in each home, um, and that's what it is around surrounding neighborhoods, so it's just something to think about. Um, also, I hope that some of these rules also pertain to the owner on site also. Um, something I didn't hear mentioned was the, um, that I mentioned before, was that boats and jet ski rentals from the short-term rentals, they, this wasn't, I haven't seen this to be addressed, um, they need special permits to be rented, and that's not being enforced or looked at into. Um, also, I just want to reiterate, residents should not have to police short-term rental code violations. So if there's an issue that we don't have code enforcement, in the evenings. It shouldn't be up to the residents to be calling the police all the time and then they look at us like, oh, that's the lady that calls the police all the time. And it gets reported, it goes on record, it goes on file. Your name is recorded. So it, we need, that has to be addressed. That's, we have to have code enforcement all the time or some looked into. Anyway, um, I would also like to see you guys revisit street parking because um, personally as a safety issue, I see this as a really big concern on Harbor Drive. Um, this weekend, there was some cars parked in front of our house or across the street. It's hard to back out. Um, if we have to call an ambulance, I don't know where they're going to park or if we need to call the fire department, if they can even get through. I have photos and video of it. I don't know who these strange cars are that come every single day. They're out of state. It's creepy. So, and you can't talk to these people. So anyway. Um, also, um, there's just a lot of traffic going on, and U-turns are happening in our driveways daily now, um, now that I set up the cameras. What used to be maybe once a month, somebody used, because I grew up here. Somebody might make a U-turn every on occasion in your driveway at the end of the road. Now, it's almost every single day, and 
I, I said before, our car was wrecked, so I don't know who did it, but anyway. Um, uh, the other thing was, um, I have heard you guys say, well, um, what, anyway, I just want to say that our families purchased 30 to 40 years ago with the expectation, we had an expectation also that it was going to be only residential and not next to motels because I heard somebody defend what people are buying today. Well, just remember what people <coughs> bought years ago, too. Um, um, my family, uh, my friend just told me a strange story. She called me from up north after I told her that we're having this short-term rental issue. And she said, she's in, let me just make this real quick. She's in Detroit, and she said her step son-in-law, she grew up here, she lives up there, he comes down here, I won't say which city, doesn't matter, but he runs short-term rentals in this county and does drug deals, brings drugs, and then does it, sells it here, and then because nobody is monitoring it, nobody knows who he is, comes, does it, and then leaves. <coughs> so that was very alarming to me. I, have, I didn't know that was going on. Anyway, so maybe that's something also, I know maybe it's a common sense rule, but maybe that needs to be also added when you guys are making all the rules that when the people make the agreement for the short-term rentals, no illegal activity, and if they do it, hey, they sign the paper, maybe extra fines, I don't know. I'm sorry that you have to be in that position, but this is what we're dealing with now, and it's scary. I mean, we always had some bad apples, but now, we, you, know, you know, you always knew who the bad apples were in your neighborhood, and to stay away from them, but now, you don't know who's coming and going. That's all, thank you. Anyone else before we close the public hearing? Good evening. My name is Randy Britz, 466 20th Avenue. Um, I was a person who watched all the uh, recent legislation going on in Tallahassee, and occupancy was an issue that was a real problem. Um, when the bill was read, it said the local governments would have control if, but they never finished that paraphrase, and I don't want that to happen here. I think we need to take a look at um, your overnight occupancy once again. If you read a lot of the ads, the ads will say sleeping quarters for eight, but read the rest of the ads, it's a party for 25. So I really think that overnight needs to be taken out. Thank you. Anyone else like to come forward? Hi, Kelly Watt, 431 Harbor Drive South. Sorry for coming in later. Um, so thank you. And um, my two comments were I think we should look at the overnight based on what the last speaker just said. And I do think the two-year vesting period is very long, probably more than it needs to be. And one year for the occupancy phase and vesting period seems more appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Anyone else at this time? Hearing none, I'm going to close the public comment. I am looking for a motion on this order. I'd like, the, uh, I'd like to make a motion that we pass a vote on the uh, SDR ordinance. And I just want to clarify for the record um, in your motion um, before we get it, if there is a second, yes. that it's in, in the moving to pass the ordinance as modified this evening, the edits particularly being in uh, section 18 to 14, uh, restricting advertisements such that, uh, sorry, I'm pretty sure, such that it would read no vacation rental may be advertised as an event venue for gatherings likely in, or intended to draw attendance in excess of the permissible occupancy as set forth in 18.216 um, or parking and parking restrictions as set forth in 18.218 on the property such as weddings, corporate retreats, or film productions. Um, and the other substantive edit was in section 18.218 um, and this related to the cottages. Um, language that we were discussing a moment ago, the other modification um, being that um, this provision shall not be construed to require the modification of any existing parking, infrastructure of any condominium property in the CT zoning district, 
four properties historically recognized as a cottage in the city where the condominium property or cottage contains units lawfully operating as short-term vacation rentals. And so those were the two modifications that there was consensus direction on. And so with that, um, is your motion to adopt the ordinance as modified? Yes, sir. Thank you. Who would like to make a second? I'll second that motion. Dan, I'm, I'm going to have you call the roll. Is there anyone who would like to make a comment? Would the maker like to make a comment? Or the second one to make a comment? No. Okay. With that, Dan, would you call the roll? Commissioner Paul? Yes. Vice Mayor Bond? Yes. Commissioner Hausberg? Yes. Commissioner Vaughn? Yes. Mayor Kennedy? Yes. Motion carries. A few, a few comments I'd like to make before we move on to our next. I want to thank everyone who's in the audience, those that are residents and also those that own vacation rentals. One of the parts that our city manager, Greg, and I saw in Tallahassee was when we were up speaking at the hearings that it was even the, those that own the short-term rentals were not for the bills that were being passed. So um, I just wanted to mention that that, um, and there were many many people who spoke on these on, on the bills. Um, I also would like to add that I want to thank not only the residents and the short-term rental owners, but I would like to thank this commission, our staff, our city attorney, our fire chief for all of the work that they did and all of, all of the residents who have been here at every single meeting with us. Um, everyone has really uh, put their best foot forward. I think that considering all that has happened, that um, we have all been good stewards you know, of our environment and of our city. Uh, I have to disagree with one of the speakers as, as far as I do think this is going to be a good ordinance and I think that we will see uh, a change. Uh, I think it will be enforceable and um, with that, I don't know if any of the commissioners would like to say anything before we move on. Madam Mayor. Yes, sir. Um, I'm happy that we passed the ordinance and I want to thank everybody for their help, their support along the way as well. Uh, what I'd love to do now, if it's okay, is maybe have Greg take a few moments and express the timeline so we have a complete understanding of expectations, if you're okay with that, Greg. Absolutely. And also, Greg, um, we're going to have to have the fees um, set for the June meeting, so could you go into that, too? Okay. I'll be happy to see you. Let me address Lance's comments first. Uh, with the adoption of the ordinance, you know, there'll be a multi-phase implementation of the ordinance. You know, the first two to three months, two months in particular, will be uh, working with staff to update all the forms and provisions of the of the ordinance. Also, there'll be training for our two code enforcement officers and uh, 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 office administrator on the on the magistrate process and how that's going to work. Um, We've initiated a, a couple months ago some initial notices to some properties that appear to be in violation of the city code and FEMA requirements. There'll be some uh, updated action on those. And as I indicated earlier to uh, Joe, as I put the uh, proposed budget together, we'll finalize the numbers for the host compliance company. Um, and I'll bring that information to you when I, when I have it. And then, uh, you know, realistically, summer four will be you know, uh, in, a, in a full operation with the new ordinance. As far as another couple things about the new budget, and I don't want to commit to what's going to be in it, what's not going to be in it, but you can expect um, an additional clerk uh, in the finance department budget that would assist in the processing of uh, vacation rental. Um, certificates and licenses um, because you know we've had estimates in their range from 1400 to 1700 of a short-term rental in the city including the city uh, you can also one of the things i'm looking at i mentioned this to one a couple of commissioners as i talked to y'all individually one of the other thing i'm considering is in the solid waste budget hiring a code enforcement person probably in the title of an environmental 
enforcement person to assist with not only uh, uh, day to day issues that we have with garbage cans and, and litter, but uh, to be a little more direct with that. But those are just all things that we're looking at working on. Uh, so between now and the adoption of the budget that goes in October the 1st, there'll be a full you know, plan put into place. The last piece of this um, that I, we need, Brandon, I need your input on is that, and I hand it back out when we, when y'all sit down this evening, I gave this to you in November. Uh, we need to come back with a resolution at the June, at the June meeting to set uh, what the fees are. And I'll just tell you, just to kind of maybe help move the conversation along, and there you know, I'll use the rain disclaimer. Whatever y'all want to set things at, that's your deal, not, not my deal, or Randy's deal. But if you look, if you, know, if you take a, a look at what I've handed you, I go to you back in November and look at it again. The average across the board annual registration fee is in the about $300 a year range. There are some cities that are more than that, so the are outlier, outliers. There's one you know, I'm looking at $600. But if you look at them consistently, they're three, two hundred dollars three fifty. So they're 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 close. Only other consideration, and um, one more in the process. You know, we all learned a lot going through this several month process. Is at the early part of this process, I was really not in favor of uh, having separate inspection fees. Uh, in light of some issues that we've had with some problem properties, I'm in favor of those now. Uh, so I also recommend that you set a first inspection fee and a second thereafter fee. Um, and just there again, you know, just to throw a, a number on the table, uh, because there's three things we're considering. One is what the annual registration fee, you can look and you can kind of see what the averages are. And on inspection fees, I would recommend that you consider somewhere else for the first inspection in the $150 range. And then if we have to go back, and most of the time we won't have to go back, if we have to go back on a problem that those fees, it's a $75 reoccurring fee every time we have to go back. So that's my input, but there again, uh, y'all can set those any way you'd like. And to be clear, you're not adopting it tonight, you're giving us the direction to have the resolution for the next meeting. <coughs> Sorry, Greg, Greg, what was the first fee? The, the registration. The, the, what are you, what, what are you recommending you look, that be sent? Yeah, if you look at the handout, you did Yeah. No, I'm not that. I'm just saying. I don't know. Right. Okay. Uh, I, I do see a list of the cities with their initial registration, inspection fees, and all that. Uh, one question I would have is, do these cities have magistrates? Uh, do they have, or are we comparing apples to apples as far as the cost of a magistrate? the cost of a second tier inspection company and are the added cost. Uh, well, I would I would love to take what you have here and perhaps have you run a budget on what it's going to cost our city uh, to run so our citizens are not paying for these short term. Well rules. we can only on the front end we can only make estimates because yes. on the magistrate experience tells me that the overwhelming majority of Vacation rentals, since that's the topic that we deal with, are not are not problem properties. So you have know, you know, a very small percentage. So we will only use the magistrate on an issue where we cited someone and they want to appeal it, or we cited one and they've not cooperated, and we then we'll schedule a magistrate hearing. So the magistrate you know, is not going to be used. It's a not lot. a. It's not a. Yeah. An, a fee. It's a fee as use. Uh, a usage fee, or is it a? They are not on retainer. They are charging hourly based on services rendered. Okay, rendered. not retainer. Right. And okay. number one, to answer your question, is three hundred dollars. Thank you. Was the recommended. And then followed by one fifteen seventy five. And, the, and the, reason why, the reason why I'm comfortable generally with the numbers I've given you is that um, is it like other ordinances? And this is why Randy months ago recommended that going you know, going forward that. The, the fees as you adjust them throughout the uh, code, it does be done by resolution. We just need to initiate this, get a year or so under our belt, and then we'll be in a better position. But I feel, based on our conversations with other cities, and to further answer your question, every city is set up different. 
you know, some cities have magistrates, some don't have magistrates at all. They, they go to the county like we're having to do now. They'll have a code advisor or a code compliance board. They're not paying those people anything with their volunteers. I, I, I don't want to get into that. Um, so I would say set it. Let's work our way through this for a year, and, and then we'll have a year's worth of budget to assess where we are. But um, you, my theory, my, my experience with this in the environmental courts and other things that I worked on established in other cities, there's always a, a peak of cases at the front end, but after you run several of those through, you'll see those level out. Uh, because if somebody just blatantly is not willing to comply and they're cited at whatever amount that the magistrate wants to cite them for, uh, that usually resolves itself. Thank <laughs> you. 